Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Climate and Clean Air Coalition Heavy Duty Vehicles Initiative webinar that will focus on marine and used vehicles. Um, I'd like to inform you that before we begin, this webinar is being recorded and that everyone is muted. There will be an opportunity for asking questions at the end of presentation, and we can unmute you when you raise your hand. So now uh, we will begin the webinar. I'd like to introduce our uh, facilitator, Mr. Raymond Jarrett from the International Council on Clean Transportation, one of the lead partners and lead implementers of the CCAC Heavy Duty Vehicles Initiative. Ray, the floor is yours. Wonderful, thank you, Denise, and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we're very glad to have this opportunity to share with you some of the work of the Heavy Duty Vehicles Initiative. So I'd first like to say a few things about the work of the initiative, um, explain what these webinars are motivated by, and, not, and then introduce our speakers. And then we'll have an opportunity for uh, discussion uh, and questions and answers. Uh, so, uh, as a co-lead of the Heavy Duty Vehicles Initiative of the CCAC, um, the ICT joins the UN Environment, uh, the United States, Canada, and Switzerland in uh, focusing the, the initiative on uh, the elimination or practical elimination of all black carbon and particulate matter emissions from heavy duty vehicles. The initiative adopted uh, a global strategy in 2016 outlining how we intend to achieve this goal with a strong emphasis on all heavy duty vehicle modes and especially uh, those powered by diesel engines and fuels. Uh, that strategy laid out uh, four tiers of intervention at geographic scale um, and these webinars are designed to capture the work that's going on at those uh, various tiers. So today we are focused on the work of the initiative uh, in international policy venues. Um, the, the initiative uh, also will have webinars this year uh, focused on sub-regional venues, uh, national policy venues, and cities. So you can look forward to more from us um, over the course of this year. And we will send out a schedule of those webinars um, soon. So, uh, to our presentations then, um, we have two presenters today. The first is uh, my colleague, Dan Rutherford, uh, who leads the Marine and Aviation Programs at the ICT. Um, he's based in our San Francisco office and has been at the ICT for 12 years. Uh, the second presenter uh, will be uh, Ari Ariadne, uh, uh, Baskin, who is a consultant to UN Environment and has been for the past two years, uh, whose main focus is on their work on the used vehicle trade uh, and is also supporting their work on electric mobility um, and their work on small island developing states. So uh, Dan will be presenting first on the work that uh, the initiative has been supporting at the IMO to reduce black carbon. And Ari will be focusing on the work that the UN Environment has been doing to uh, help control emissions from the trade of used vehicles. Um, so that's it for my introduction. What I will do now is pass it over to my colleague, Dan, who will make our first presentation. Um, and Dan, the floor is yours. Great, thanks, Ray, and hello to everyone, and thanks for joining. Um, I will be sharing my slides in a second, if I can get uh, the control for that. Sorry about that, Dan. Denise, can you please um, share Dan's screen? Okay, sorry for the technical difficulties here. I think we're in the process of making that happen, Dan. Give us a second. No worries. Uh, I guess I'll just say a few words as we wait for that. Um, so I'm very happy to be presenting uh, this work to everyone today. Um, I 
have been working with a colleague, uh, Brian Comer, ah, here we go, uh, on um, this work to uh, reduce and control black carbon emissions from international shipping uh, since about 2014. And um, have, I think, a good track record, uh, both of uh, policy success and also how um, CCAC activities can uh, support uh, policy progress in other UN bodies that I'll say a few words about today. So I believe everyone should be able to see my screen now. Yeah, it's still it's still taking a second for some of us to see it, Dan, but why don't you go on? Okay, I will push ahead then. Um, you should see an overview slide now or shortly, uh, which lays out the structure of my presentation today. Uh, start out with giving some general background about black carbon emissions from international shipping. Um, we'll then talk about the annual technical workshops that we've been doing um, through CCAC sponsorship uh, and how those have been um, contributing to IMO policy progress on controlling black carbon emissions. Uh, and then uh, we'll dig in a little bit deeper on that specific question uh, and highlight um, the successes we've had so far and uh, the path forward on getting binding policies to control black carbon emissions from ships. Uh, and then I'll conclude with a few simple thoughts. So we've been able to do a great deal of research over the past five years on black carbon emissions from international shipping. Uh, and CCAC support has been critical to, uh, for that. Um, so I'm going to present about four slides here, which uh, lay out the background of uh, how much black carbon is emitted, um, where it's emitted, and what the climate uh, and also health impacts are. Um, uh, most of this information is new and it's been generated over the past five years, which I think is a uh, testament to the importance of this work. Um, we released a global inventory of black carbon emissions from international shipping uh, in 2017. Uh, and this map shows um, where those emissions are distributed across shipping lanes globally. Uh, we estimate that about 78,000 tons of black carbon uh, was emitted from inter international shipping in 2015. Um, that's roughly between four and 6% of all black carbon from uh, diesel fueled engines globally. Uh, on the health impact side, uh, there've been more studies, but ballpark we estimate between uh, 60,000 and 100,000 people die prematurely uh, due to exposure from air pollution from ships. Uh, not only black carbon, but particulate matter generally, and also um, from ozone form from NOx emissions. Now, if you look specifically at the climate implications of black carbon, you'll see that they're really quite large. Um, we estimate that black carbon is the second most important climate forcer from international shipping. Um, it's responsible for between 7 and 21% of shipping's overall climate impact, uh, depending upon the timescales uh, that you analyze. Um, now, these numbers might be a little bit of an underestimate uh, because increasingly we're seeing um, more and more uh, emissions of black carbon um, near the Arctic uh, as Arctic shipping routes uh, open up. This slide uh, points to this. Um, in addition to the 2015 inventory, we've also analyzed 2017 global operations data. And over that period, we've seen a significant increase in the number of ships operating within the Arctic, uh, the amount of heavy fuel oil they are carrying and burning, and also the black carbon emissions from those ships. So depending upon your metric, uh, you're seeing between 30% and almost 60% increase uh, uh, in fuel use or black carbon emissions. That's just over the past two years uh, due to the increase in Arctic shipping. With that background, let me say a, a little bit about the annual black carbon technical workshops that CCAC has helped support. Um, to take a st step back for a second, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, IMO decision making and um, 
it's always dangerous to use an iceberg analogy in shipping, but I'll, I'll give it a try. Um, if you look at how IMO makes uh, its decisions, uh, it can be a, a very effective organization um, because of its um, its decision making process and also the existence of a legally binding treaty uh, called MARPOL for short. Um, but IMO is very bandwidth limited. Um, its environmental committee meets um, one to two weeks per year. Uh, its subcommittee that works on specifically pollution issues at the technical level meets one week per year. And within any of those weeks, there are a variety of uh, issues being discussed. Um, in the case of black carbon, it's typical because the agenda at IMO is very packed that black carbon receives about two to three hours of the agenda at any weekly meeting. Um, so at the pollution prevention and response subcommittee level, which meets once per year, black carbon typically gets about three years of airtime. Um, obviously that's insufficient to um, tackle really meaty technical uh, dialogues uh, and also insufficient to actually develop control policies. Um, so it's necessary to foster these parallel and offline discussions. And that's really what we've been doing over the past five years um, through these annual technical workshops where we convene the various technical advisors to IMO delegations, typically in September of a year, um, we spend a couple of days hashing out um, some key technical re and research questions. Uh, we discuss those and then we prepare a consensus document that is then submitted to IMO to structure the, the policy discussion at the, the following year's PPR meeting. Um, so we're now on, uh, we're starting year six for uh, this work. Uh, you can see in uh, this table, the five workshops we've held to date, uh, and the sixth workshop that is currently being planned for late September in Helsinki. Helsinki. Uh, we started uh, in Ottawa in 2014, um, where we really uh, focused on the definition issue, and I'll come back to this uh, in the IMO context shortly. Um, after that, um, we held a workshop in the Netherlands um, on measurement, Back to Canada in 2016, where we uh, discussed um, refined procedures for measuring black carbon. Um, and then we've had two workshops in the United States, one in DC, in our uh, DC office last year, and then in San Francisco in my home office, focusing on specifically which measure, uh, which instruments can be used to measure black carbon, uh, and then also what our control options are. Uh, and I will relate this back to the progress at IMO shortly. Uh, this gives you a flavor of the uh, workshops themselves. Uh, this is the San Francisco workshop uh, in September of last year where we had a variety of participants, 27 in total, uh, bridging uh, government representatives, representatives from industry, from research organizations, from philanthropy, uh, also uh, from the classification societies, uh, shipbuilders, ship owners, et cetera. Um, so this group uh, came together for uh, two days and in a, a, I think a really constructive fashion, identified the control technologies that could be um, promoted through IMO policies. Now, uh, the results of this workshop were written up as a workshop report, then submitted to IMO uh, and various uh, member states then commented on that workshop report uh, and um, that led to the progress uh, that I'll describe shortly in May of this year. These were the 13 black carbon control technologies that were identified in the workshop. Uh, in general terms, uh, we're looking at clean fuels, exhaust gas uh, after treatment, uh, and then engine side controls, either um, engine tuning for um, existing electronically controlled diesel engines or a movement of some to some sort of zero emission uh, technology uh, for example full battery electric or fuel cells 
powered by uh, synthetic fuels. Um, we looked at scrubbers, which are very much in the news these days, because IMO is shifting to a 0.5% uh, global sulfur limit in 2020, uh, and concluded that those were not particularly effective at removing black carbon. And I can double back on this point in the question and answer session if desired. Uh, we did also look at one operational uh, measure, slow steaming. Um, that's widely used by industry today to um, reduce fuel costs during times of soft market demand uh, and found that that does reduce black carbon emissions, although at very slow speeds, you start to see a drop off in its effectiveness. So I'll, I'll say a few words about IMO progress in regulating black carbon and then close my presentation. So IMO has been working through this three-step uh, technical work plan on black carbon uh, really since 2011. Uh, and it, um, there were three components of that. First, uh, coming to a consensus uh, operational definition of black carbon. Second, identifying appropriate measurement methods that could be used to measure it and therefore uh, could support a certification standard. Uh, and then third, identifying a list of appropriate control measures. Um, these three steps really provided the focus of our technical workshops since um, 2014. Um, in 2015, IMO agreed to the Bond et al. definition of black carbon. I believe uh, most likely some on this uh, call recognize that definition and also its importance. Um, to our knowledge, it's the first time that bond at all definition was used, um, was, was ratified by uh, government for potential policy use. Uh, in 2018, we narrowed down potential measurement methods to three, filter smoke number, photoacoustic spectroscopy, and um, laser induced incandescence. Uh, and these three measurement me methods will be taken forward as potentially the basis for future regulation. Uh, and then this year in May, um, we uh, discussed um, up to 40 uh, candidate control measures at uh, the IMO's subcommittee level. Uh, and those were agreed as a package and forwarded on for future consideration for control, uh, control measures. Um, the 13 that we down-selected to in our fifth workshop uh, were highlighted as having, um, having uh, higher priority within that decision-making. Uh, the next step is to agree to a control policy by 2021, uh, as laid out in uh, this next slide. Um, we've, um, we've managed to wrap up the three-point work plan, finally. Uh, and we now have a pretty tight mandate to agree to some sort of uh, control policy or regulation by PPR 8, which is in 2021. Um, there's going to be discussion both of the regulation itself and also the measurement protocol that can uh, ensure the regulations uh, are implemented effectively. Um, once the subcommittee wraps up its work, it will submit a report back to the 77th meeting of the Marine Environmental Protection Committee, uh, which will then consider the subcommittee's recommendations and then uh, agree to control measures under uh, the MARPOL uh, treaty. Um, from our end, we, continue, we need to continue to convene the IMO experts to build the technical foundation for this policy progress. Again, any particular meeting uh, will get two to three uh, hours of airtime for black carbon discussions. And unless we continue to convene the, the technical advisors in this structured way, uh, it's likely that these timescales will not be met. Um, just a few concluding thoughts. Uh, I hope you come away from this presentation with an understanding that black carbon is a key climate forcer from international shipping. Um, you've seen some numbers suggesting that as Arctic shipping expands, 
there's a potential for even more black carbon to be emitted uh, in these sensitive areas. Uh, I've given you a flavor for how CCAC supported technical workshops have been an important catalyst for IMO progress. Uh, and I hope uh, you've come away with an idea of some of the key technologies that could be used to reduce marine black carbon, um, including clean fuels, advanced engines, and exhaust gas after treatment. Uh, and hopefully in about uh, two years time, I can be back here uh, presenting the results of the agreed control measures at IMO. Uh, that's it for me. Maybe I'll turn it back to Ray. Great. Thanks so much, Dan, for your presentation. That was a great overview. Um, for those who want to ask Dan a question, um, please use the control panel on your screen. Um, we'll be taking questions at the end of the next presentation. So if you have comments or questions on Dan's presentation, um, please capture those now and we'll, we'll as I said, take those um, once we enter the discussion session. Now, while Denise is transferring the presentation control over to Ari, I wanted to just uh, ask you, Dan, a few, um, a few quick questions. Um, the first is, how can people access your presentation? Um, uh, will that be available online, or should we find a way to make that available to people? Um. I think probably, um, Ray, if we could work together to find a way to, to make available, that would be the, the, the best way forward. Um, for those that are interested in the workshops that I outlined, if you go on uh, the ICCT.org's website, you'll see that we, we have posted every presentation given on this topic over the past five years. So there's a, there's a lot on our website already, um, but Ray, I think you and I should work together uh, to get this presentation out. Yeah, um, one of the things that the CCAC Secretariat is good at doing is uh, uploading these kinds of presentations on their website as well as an available resource. And we can work together with the Secretariat to make this an additional resource that's accessible through the Heavy Duty Vehicles Initiative webpage. Um, if people want to contact you directly, Dan, how can they contact you? Uh, well, they're free to contact me by email. Um, those of us who have been at ICCT for a while have very simple email addresses. So my email address is just my first name, Dan, D-A-N, at the ICCT.org. Great. Thank you. Um, there was uh, just one question for clarification. Uh, we have a commenter from Sri Lanka named Yasiru who's asking, isn't black carbon controlled by the IMO's 2020 sulfur regulations? Could you respond to that, Dan? Uh, that's a, a surprisingly complicated question. Uh, IMO's 2020 sulfur regulations are specifically on the sulfur content of the fuels. Uh, and in this case, it will it will force a shift from um, global average content of about 2.5% uh, down to 0.5% starting in 2020. Um, but there are a variety of ways that ship owners and operators can comply with that requirement. Um, if they shifted from uh, heavy fuel oil to res uh, distillate fuel, diesel fuel, then yes, we, we estimate that would have um, about a 30% reduction impact on black carbon. Uh, scrubbers, uh, it looks to be smaller than that. And um, there are uh, a number of ships that are likely to comply with using what we call um, fuel blends. Um, so mi some sort of mix of uh, heavy fuel oil and distillate fuel. Uh, and there's some research, actually fairly alarming, that um, those fuels might actually have higher black carbon emission factors than conventional heavy fuel oil. Uh, it, it, we're still working out why that is, but uh, if a lot of ships um, use blends instead of going just purely to distillate, uh, we could see, in, uh, in essence, no reduction of black carbon uh, emissions as a result. 
Um, and just one last question for you, Dan. You were, I think, making a pretty strong case for the role that CCAC plays in facilitating basically the extra technical time needed outside of the MEPC and PPR. Um, you were saying that that of the one week that MEPC meets, that Black Carbon maybe gets three hours. Um, I, you might have misspoken on the PPR side. Can you just say how, many, how much time is given to Black Carbon on the PPR uh, during the PPR week? Right, right. Uh, it's a, a similar amount, maybe slightly less. Um, it, these IMO meetings are very busy. They, they, they last about a week. Uh, there's a plenary discussion. And then typically there's a there are three to five working groups that meet uh, at the same time. Those working groups um, typically have two to two and a half days to wrap up their work. And Black Carbon will just be one of maybe 10 or 12 agenda items. And so it, it's similar. I would say a PPR typically we get um, two-ish hours uh, for that year's meeting to discuss Black Carbon. Okay, I think that's it. And that, that that's the end of my series of questions here. But I think the point is clear. And hopefully for those um, CCAC uh, participants on the line here, um, you can see that the CCAC is facilitating this opportunity for all countries that are uh, IMO member states to engage in the question of should we be controlling black carbon from international shipping and how do we do that? And I think the momentum is there. The heavy duty vehicles initiative is really um, making this happen. And so for all of, all of you who are interested in where your country stands um, and how it can support this dialogue, please make contact with Dan to explore further. So with that, uh, let's transition to our second presenter, um, Ariadne Baskin, who is going to give us an overview of a UN Environment's used vehicles work uh, and the importance this has in managing the fleet of legacy vehicles that um, are some of the highest emitters uh, and are entering countries that themselves may have zero emission standards. So Ari, we're really looking forward to your presentation. I'll hand it over to you. Um, thank you, Ray, and thank you, Dan, for that insightful presentation. I'm going to shift gears from marine to on-road used vehicles. So to start off, my name is Ariadne Baskin, and I'm a consultant in the Air Quality and Mobility Unit at UN Environment, based out of Nairobi. Thank you again for taking some time out of your day to listen in to UN Environment's work on used vehicles, used vehicles being a largely ignored piece of the transport, environment, and development puzzle. My presentation today will underscore the need to import clean and safe used vehicles instead of essentially importing polluting and damaging vehicles, importing country government responses to regulate the intake of used vehicles in order to capitalize on advanced vehicle technology from advanced markets, global and regional supply chains of used light duty vehicles with some data on heavy duty vehicles, and finally a snapshot of used vehicles in Africa. So UN Environment has spent the past year working on demystifying the used vehicle market. So understanding the global and regional flows the scale of these flows and the regulatory environment of different countries. In order to understand if used vehicles contribute to the sustainable development of importing low and middle income countries. So how to promote vehicles that are affordable, clean and provide safe technology and prevent the dumping of dirty and unsafe vehicles. To do this, UN Environment has developed the first ever Global Used Vehicle Database, which covers over 165 countries in five regions. This database can answer questions such as how many vehicles does X country import? What is the port of entry? Who are the main exporters? Or how does X country govern the int intake of these vehicles? Do they apply an age standard, an emission standard? Do they have fiscal incentives? And so on. A database was formulated in congruence to the Global Used Vehicle Database. The Africa Used Vehicle Questionnaire was filled out by over 35 African governments on the status of used 
these vehicles in their countries and provided excellent first-hand um, data. The, the Global Used Vehicle Database and the Africa Used Vehicle National Questionnaire supported the development of the first finding global status of used vehicle report, which seeks to paint a clearer picture on the scarcity of data and limited understanding of used vehicle flows, the impact of used vehicles on the environment, so local pollutants, health and emissions, and on safety and economies in developing markets that rely on used vehicle imports for mobility. I will expand on the new global program that UN Environment is setting up at the end of this presentation. So why improve used vehicles? There is a direct correlation between basic import restrictions and a less outdated and more more clean and technologically advanced fleet. Unregulated used vehicles are highly correlated with safety, pollutant emissions, fuel consumption and CO2 emissions, higher operating costs, such as for maintenance and fuel, oil consumption and import, and have, ve and have a lot of vehicle and scrappage issues related to it. Ultimately, developing countries have the opportunity to leapfrog to cleaner and more efficient technologies if they decide to capitalize on the best available technology from exporting markets. I will now present a global overview of used light duty vehicles, so the global supply chain and the global regulatory environment. There is very limited and scarce data on the global trade of heavy duty vehicles. The limited data that we have, I will expand in on the Africa section of this presentation. So the map in front of you um, presents the global supply chain of used vehicles from the three major exporters in 2017, that being Japan, the European Union, and the United States, um, who um, exported a total of 2.5 million, 946,000 from the EU, Japan following closely under with 931,000, and the USA with 650,000. Just to point out, these numbers were a struggle to source and involved tireless calls and meetings with the Japanese Export Vehicle Inspection Center, JEVIC, the U.S. Department of Commerce, International Trade Administration, and Eurostrat, as there is very limited available and disaggregated data on used vehicle flows, and there exist discrepancies between trade statistics of imp importers and exporters. And to point out again that these numbers are incomplete, but are the best available source of data on the scale and behavior of used vehicle flows. There is an urgent need to develop easily accessible and transparent used vehicle data. From the map, you can see that there were around 2.5 used vehicle, 2.5 million used vehicles exported from these three major um, groups. The UAE is Japan's biggest importer and is a major hub for Japanese used vehicles exported to East and Southern Africa. New Zealand, Myanmar and other South Asian states are also major importers of Japanese used vehicles. Most of the EU used vehicles are headed to other EU countries and to West Africa. Chile and South Africa, as you can see, ban used vehicles, but are major importers of Japanese used vehicles as they are major gateways or corridors to the used vehicle market in South America and Southern Africa, respectively. The USA mostly exports to Central America and the Caribbean, West Africa and the Middle East. So current actions um, taken to that importing countries take to ensure clean and safer used light duty vehicles. So there are a wide range of measures countries can take to, to promote the import of quality used vehicles. This ranges from regulatory and fiscal measures, such as banning used vehicles in India, Chile and South Africa, 
revising the ban on, on used vehicles to allow for electric used vehicles in Egypt and Bhutan, to setting an emission standard of Euro 4 in Sri Lanka, to a five-year age limit in Cote d'Ivoire and the Bahamas. Sri Lanka eliminates all duty on electric used vehicles, and Mauritius has a progressive excess tax that promotes the use of more energy efficient used vehicles based on energy capacity and CO2 emissions. So quickly, some maps on the regulatory environment of used vehicles from around the world. So the map in front of you shows global used light duty vehicle use import bans. 13% of the countries we have studied ban used vehicle imports. It's a very popular measure in South America and Asia. However, it's important to point out that this is not always an ideal, ideal approach. For instance, Ecuador bans used vehicles, but as a Euro 1 emission standard. With stronger emission standards, the country could benefit from cleaner used vehicles. Recently, Egypt and Bhutan amended its ban on used vehicles to allow for electric vehicles. Um, this map shows global age-based light-duty vehicle import restrictions. As you can see, there is very little harmonization, especially in Africa and Asia, and harmonization is essential as divergent aid, age limits allow for the leakages of vehicles across porous um, borders. The next map shows global used vehicle um, Euro equivalent standards, so emission standards. As you can see in Africa and in Central America and the Caribbean, most countries do not have vehicle emission standards on used vehicles. And when they do, such as in Nigeria, which has a Euro 2, I believe, does not have requisite fuel quality, which hampers um, emission reductions. I'm now going to provide a brief overview of used light duty vehicles and heavy duty vehicles in Africa. So to briefly sketch out the situation, 85% to 85 to 100% of vehicles in most African countries are used vehicles. This is above 95% in countries such as Cameroon, Malawi, Sierra Leone, Uganda, Zimbabwe, and so on. As really without a well-established vehicle manufacturing base, Africa depends on used vehicle imports for mobility. The number of used vehicles on the continent will increase as motorization continues to soar. Most used vehicles are sourced through the internet, up to 90% in many countries. Africa has the highest per capita road traffic fatality rate, projected to increase by 112% by, by 2030. UN Environment is working with NCAP and so forth on establishing, on better establishing the relationship between used vehicles and road accidents. And in Africa, there has been an increase in transport emissions, 95% in North America and 75% in Sub-Saharan Africa. So where are these light duty vehicles coming from? Uh, most light duty vehicles um, entering Africa are headed towards West Africa, followed by Southern Africa and followed by Eastern Africa and Southern Africa. This slide is better depicted in a table um, with the exact numbers which I um, can provide you. It's important again to point out that these numbers are incomplete as the Japanese data we acquired were only for the top 50 countries and they do not include statistics from other markets such as India and China. Also, the data fails to recognize the final destination of the vehicle and only indicates the point of entry, such as a lot of West, a lot of vehicles headed to Togo, Benin and Nigeria are part of the supply chain into more inland Western Africa and Central Africa. So as you can see, Nigeria gets by far the most vehicles, almost double the amount of Kenya, largely from the EU and the US. The port of Mombasa is the major market in East Africa and gets used vehicles from Japan, mostly via the United Arab Emirates. And while South Africa bans used vehicles, is a major corridor um, of used vehicles entering Southern Africa. Here, I won't go into this, but um, we've developed 
in congruence with the government region an understanding of how used vehicles enter the country, their entrance point and so forth. So I've depicted that um, in different West African states. So now the export of used heavy duty vehicles from Japan and the EU. So as you can see, South Africa is the biggest market. You can assume that these vehicles are again headed to its neighbors. As I pointed out, South Africa bans used vehicles. East Africa is the second biggest market with Tanzania, Kenya, and Uganda receiving, receiving a, quite a quantity of trucks. And Nigeria is the fifth biggest market of Japanese used heavy duty vehicles. But that's because it mostly imports heavy duty vehicles from the EU and US. So overall, Nigeria receives the most used heavy duty vehicles. However, this data fails to answer the quality of these trucks and buses coming in. So we don't know the age and so forth of these trucks. Um, the next slide is from Eurostat. So the export of used heavy duty vehicles from the EU. As you can see again, West Africa dominates used heavy duty vehicles from the EU. If you look at the total data, the total global database, most heavy duty vehicles from the EU are headed to other countries in the EU and to Eastern Europe with Georgia topping the list. So information on heavy duty vehicles in Africa is very scarce. And this is highly problematic as they have major impacts on emissions, air pollution, and safety. The information on this slide was sourced from GFEI baselines and reports, as well as from the Africa Used Vehicle Questionnaires. Just quickly, in Niger, 99.9% .9 of heavy duty vehicles are imported from the EU with an average on-road on age of 29 years. Similarly, in Uganda, 85.6% of imported HDVs are from Japan. Whereas in contrast, in Kenya, most buses are assembled locally and brought new. As you can see from that, chat, from that chart, the fuel economy of the HDV fleet in Uganda has progressively gone up. Um, dieselization, so is Africa becoming the world's dumping ground for dirty diesel, dirty diesel vehicles? So as the market for diesels falters in Western Europe, millions of diesels will flow into Eastern Europe and West Africa and so on. Even if Africa imports a high quality diesel car or truck, the maximum environmental benefits are not always realized due to low quality fuel in most countries. The majority of African countries use fuel with sulfur, with sulfur levels of 2,500 to 10,000 ppm. Some countries have taken preventative measures to counter this, such as Nigeria, Ethiopia, and Ghana, which have priced diesel fuel higher than petrol. In Ghana, the average age of used diesel imports um, is 1.7 years compared to 6.1 years for petrol as a result of financial disincentives against diesels. Now, looking at the regulatory environment of used vehicle, like of used light duty vehicle imports into Africa, there is very little harmonization, as I said. Um, before, this map depicts age limits within the country. Most countries have a nine year or above age limit with no policy. Five countries impose a total ban and six countries ban import over five years. Here's a snapshot of what you get from the questionnaire. So the average age of vehicles imported into Liberia are 10 years, Sierra Leone, 15 years and so forth. Five countries in Africa have heavy duty vehicle age limits all seven years and above, such as the DRC has a seven year, Guinea 12 year and Madagascar has a differentiated age limit with 15 years for trucks and 10 years for buses. Um, here's it more spelt out in this table. And now I'm gonna briefly touch on the UN Environment and FIA Foundation new global program on used vehicles. So the global program will focus on promoting better quality used vehicles for Africa. So not to ban, but to regulate and improve. It will focus on safety, emissions, and cost saving. And it will take the idea that it really takes two to tango, takes two to tango, 
as only unilateral action in vehicle importing countries will not help, vehicle exporting countries must also take responsibility and it will involve the, tr the used vehicle trade industry, public partners and so forth. And um, on this slide, we sketch out the program objectives, which are to raise awareness, deliver road safety targets, support importing countries with the introduction of policies and incentives, support exporting countries to ensure they don't dump dirty and unsafe vehicles, support harmonization of policies and incentives at regional and sub-regional level, provide safety and environment labeling, develop policy matrix, and support training and capacity building. Thank you. Wonderful, great work, Ari, and thanks so much for that um, that presentation. Maybe you can go back to the previous slide so people can see your um, your contact information there. Um, uh, thank you. So, uh, for those who would like to um, continue the discussion on used vehicles, please send in your questions to the question box uh, so that we can incorporate those into this uh, this next discussion session. Um, before we get into that, Ari, um, just one thing that really jumps out at me here from your work is the extent to which uh, high-income countries, particularly those in Europe, but also Japan and the U.S., are major exporters of these um, these these vehicles, um, especially to Africa. But these are countries that also today have what we consider to be the the best practices uh, and the the most stringent vehicle emission standards. So. Um, so what I see is um, a pattern of controlling one's own new vehicle fleet, but then basically shifting the burden of uh, high emissions onto the receiving countries. Um, so there's a bit of an environmental justice issue going on here. Um, what interest have you um, heard from either the US, European countries, or Japan in actually managing their export policies? So to the state, I think there is very little interest for them to manage the export policies because exporting used vehicles um, is a cash incentive for them. So for instance, in Japan, you're incentivized to get rid of a vehicle after a certain amount of years because it's too expensive to operate. Um, so a part of this global program would be to bring the exporters on the table and to make and to help them be in the process of supporting global development goals such as the Paris Climate Accord and safety and so forth. Yeah, considering the very strong economic incentives to 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 sell, you know, to basically capture the residual value of these used vehicles, um, one has yeah. to find. Um, where the incentive lies to keep those vehicles or to make make them cleaner or to send cleaner vehicles than than the country that's receiving uh than the than the receiving countries require something to that effect but it seems like um, a very important issue and one that i'm glad that UN environment is tackling um so what I wanted to do at this point was just use the last 10 minutes to take some additional questions that we've now been getting uh, on, on both topics. Um, I'm going to turn back to the, uh, the IMO um, presentation. Dan, I have some additional questions that have been coming in for you. Um, so we'll start with you. Um, first, could you reiterate the concrete targets that have been proposed for controlling black carbon, uh, if any? Um, so if you could just explain once more what the, the I guess, IMO has committed itself to explore uh, over what timelines. Um, uh, and, and, and again, remind people what the policy measures are that they're considering. Um, and how likely is it that any of these things will be adopted by IMO? Right. So that's your first question. Uh, Okay, I think I caught three there. Um, the first on numerical targets. Uh, at, at the current time, um, IMO has not established any numerical targets for black carbon reduction. Um, there are a couple of related, um, I guess, ballpark figures. Um, one is a number that came out of the IPCC 1.5 report that suggested that 
uh, in order to um, meet you know the Paris compatible compatible climate targets that anthropogenic black carbon emissions overall would need to be reduced by at least 35 percent by 2050. Um, IMO also has a greenhouse gas target uh, to reduce uh, greenhouse gases overall by at least 50 percent by 2050 compared to 2008 levels. Um, so both of those suggest um, pretty significant reductions and in fact IMO is currently investigating whether black carbon should be integrated into the greenhouse gas targets um, starting um, next year through its, um, its inventory. So currently no numerical targets, but we have a few, I guess, signposts for the direction that IMO might go. Uh, in terms of control policies, um, from our perspective, we see kind of three buckets generally. Uh, so one would be an emission standard for new build engines, um, perhaps similar to what IMO has required for NOx through its tier one, tier two, and then tier three standards. Um, clean fuels will clearly be part of the solution, uh, either a switch to distillate or uh, to some future fuel that is potentially zero emissions, uh, like electricity or hydrogen. Uh, and then third, because ships turn over so slowly, um, we know that even a, a stringent new build engine standard um, would be very delayed in its effectiveness. Um, so we're, we're considering whether there's a role to, to play in um, control policies for in-use engines, um, either some sort of, at a minimum, um, um, a maintenance standard, uh, or more likely an in-use emission standard or some sort of control that would um, prioritize the use of the cleanest engines in sensitive areas like the Arctic. So kind of three big buckets there. Um, third question, how likely is IMO to succeed in 2021? Um, you know, I'm cautiously optimistic here. Um, we saw, frankly, very little progress on black carbon for three years from 2011 to 2014 until we started this initiative. And then through building this additional bandwidth and um, gathering experts and generating trust, we've seen the pace of decisions speed up over time. Um, so I'm cautiously optimistic we'll get some sort of control measure in 2021. Um, the question is, will it be mandatory under MARPOL? And then also how much work afterwards will be needed to, um, I guess, figure out the nuts and bolts. Uh, those are more open questions. Hmm. Um, there's a question asking, isn't black carbon already addressed in the climate change strategy IMO has introduced in 2018? So another excellent question. Uh, IMO has, set a greenhouse gas reduction target based predominantly on, uh, on projections for fuel use and CO2 only. Um, it, it then has had subsequent conversations about how to define greenhouse gases. Uh, and I think there's general agreement that um, CO2 obviously is in, that methane slip should be in, and I think there's um, more and more understanding that black carbon should be in. Uh, and I mentioned this earlier that we've done our own global black carbon inventory. For the first time, IMO will be doing its own global black carbon inventory next year through the fourth greenhouse gas study. Um, there's just a kind of a small process hiccup there is um, IMO has adopted a greenhouse gas target, black carbon, Black carbon is a short-lived climate forcer, but it's not a gas. And so that has created a, a window for some of the, um, for some nations who want to take a go slow approach to, to sort of put out process barriers. But I, I'm fairly confident that moving forward, black carbon will be integrated into IMO's uh, broader climate strategy. And just one last question for you. Which of the reduction opportunities for controlling BC in the Arctic specifically would you think have the highest potential to be agreed on within the IMO? Uh, so 
Certainly moving away from heavy fuel oil use in the Arctic uh, is very important. And somewhat separate from discussions of a black carbon emission standard, um, IMO is currently developing uh, a, a, a ban on heavy fuel use in the Arctic. Um, we're in the stage of doing some impact assessments uh, for that. So I think step one really is to get off heavy fuel oil. Um, our preference would be move immediately to distillate since that provides immediate benefits and also opens up the opportunity for advanced after treatment that we see in other modes. Uh, and then ultimately, as the technologies mature, um, the priority use of zero emission vessels uh, in the Arctic uh, is a direction we we would like to see IMO go. Great, thanks for those uh, responses, Dan. Um, great work. Um, I just want to switch back to Ari um, and just have a few final questions for you, Ari, on your uh, on your presentation on used vehicles. Um, you outlined these trading flows uh, for used vehicles from a kind of a small list of, of high income countries. Um, there's a question about whether you have seen similar patterns for fuel the fuel trade or say the dirty fuel trade. So you've outlined the flows of dirty the dirty vehicle trade. Does the dirty fuel trade follow a similar pattern? Um so I would expect countries that have um very little emission, a very poor um, fuel quality to import more damaged or more polluting uh, used vehicles because they don't have the fuel quality to have the requisite emission standards to have the engines work properly. But I think each country is also very particular. Um, with this matter. Yeah, there's a, uh, a fair, there was a report published by a Swiss um, NGO called Public Eye that brought, yeah. I think, some new attention to the, to the, the, the challenge of export of um, um, high benzene, high sulfur, including fuels that have um, manganese content to uh, countries, particularly in West Africa. That report was called Dumping Dirty dirty diesel, I believe. And um, and that, the, mm -hmm. Sorry, if you look at the trade flows which come out from this data, the majority of vehicles are headed to West Africa from the EU and so forth. And also, if you look more into the data, um, the vehicles headed to West Africa are often older than vehicles to other parts of Africa. Yeah, and it's clearly, I mean, from what I've seen, it's also not just coming from Europe. Uh, to take an example from our global sulfur strategy, um, we did an analysis of major um, producers of high sulfur diesel fuel. I think the second highest producer was South Korea, to my surprise. Uh, and I've had discussions with the Korean representative of CCAC about this. So there is this flow, I think this pattern of not just vehicles, but also fuels. And to the extent these countries, particularly in Africa, but elsewhere um, as well, are receiving both from a similar subset of countries, I think it creates a fairly short list of targets that we, uh, within the initiative, can and should be working with um, amongst the CCAC partners. And we're um, also increasing hmm. evidence of filters being removed in West Africa, used vehicles coming without filters and so forth. Right, agreed. Right. Okay, well, we're out of time. I uh, wanted to thank everyone for joining. Our next uh, webinar will be in about three months. We'll focus on sub-regional policy venues. So we'll be looking at ASEAN, um, uh, sort of give to give some examples, ASEAN, ECOWAS, SADAC, MERCOSUR, uh, regions where we see opportunities for harmonizing fuel quality and vehicle emission standards and coordinating um, efforts at that scale. So uh, with that, I want to thank everyone for participating. I hope you have a great day and we'll see you again soon. Take care.